welcome to the third day of the study of the book the bahai faith and introduction by gloria fezi today we are going to study the second session of part 1 the history of the faith bahaula the persecution which followed the advent of the bab had not ended when bahaula declared his mission in 1863 he was born among the nobility of iran His father, a minister of state, was the first to notice that he was different from other children. But soon, others came to see the many signs of greatness in him. Bahá'u'lláh was still a child when he became renowned for his knowledge and for his extraordinary insight into the difficult passages of Holy Scriptures. People brought their problems to him and learned authorities on religion listened to his discourses, marveled at his wisdom. What seemed most strange to them was that Bahá'u'lláh had never had a teacher or entered any school. But it was not his knowledge alone which attracted all types of people to him. His love, wing nature and enchanted modesty owned the hearts of all who knew him. As he grew up, he became known as the defender of the oppressed and the refuse of the poor. He was always surrounded by people and children were devoted to him. Though he was brought up in riches and comfort, he sought no attachment to the material things around him and gave of his wealth freely to the needy. He loved the beauty of nature and often roamed alone in countryside. When his father died, the government offered Bahá'u'lláh the minister's position, but he refused it. The prime minister was not surprised. Such a position, he said, is unworthy of him. I cannot understand him, but I am convinced that he is destined for some lofty career. His thoughts are not like ours. Bahá'u'lláh was in Tehran when the Báb declared his mission to his first disciples in Shiraz. But the new message reached Bahá'u'lláh through the Báb's first disciple. and he accepted it without the least hesitation though he had never met the bab himself he was then 27 having identified himself with the cause of the bab bahaula arose to promulgate its teachings and share the sufferings of his followers before long all his persecutions and possessions were confiscated and he himself was thrown into an underground dungeon called the black pit where 150 murderers and highway robbers were imprisoned and where the only opening was the door through which they entered in this whole place bahaula spent four months and the heavy chains which he bore on his neck left their mark on his body to the end of his days yet it was In this gloomy dungeon that Bahá'u'lláh became fully aware of the revelation which was to flow through him to the rest of mankind. The gentle Báb had been martyred and many thousands of his followers had by now laid down their lives for the new cause. The few who remained homeless and broken-hearted were being hunted down by their cruel enemies. But Bahá'u'lláh knew that the blood of the martyrs had watered the mighty tree of God's cause and that nothing could stop its growth until it had gathered all the people of the world under its shadow after four months when he was so ill that they thought he would die bahaula was released from the dungeon but banished from his native land so great was the love he had created in the hearts of his friends that a number of them voluntarily went into exile with him his young wife and two of his children also shared his banishment the third child had to be left behind with relatives he was so young that no one thought he could endure the rigors of the long and dreadful journey ahead of them through snowbound mountains in the heart of winter with no proper clothing or food Bahá'u'lláh remained in exile in Baghdad for 10 years. He had arrived broken in health, destitute of worldly belongings and branded as a heretic. It was not long, however, 
before people of all backgrounds and dominations came seeking his presence. They arrived from far and near, forgetting the differences of class, color, and reason, as they sat together listening to his teachings. At a time when religious fanaticism was at its height and people of different beliefs never met as friends in the home of Baha'u'llah, they came together as a brothers and heralding the dawn of a new age. This was not to be tolerated by Baha'u'llah's enemies, who had hoped that the movement started by the Bab had been uprooted from their midst. They resorted, in, resorted to every means in their power until they had persuaded the government to send Baha'u'llah further away from his native country. As order, an order was issued, banishing him to Constantinople in Turkey. On the day of his departure from Baghdad, hundreds of people flocked around his house with tearful eyes, longing to catch a last glimpse of the one who had given them so much and asked for nothing in return. Before leaving for Constantinople, Baha'u'llah stayed in a beautiful garden outside Baghdad for 12 days. A tent was pitched for him in a lo lovely spot surrounded with the perfume of roses and the song of nightingales. His many friends who came to bid him farewell were filled with anguish at his departure, not knowing what fresh calamities awaited him and what was to become of themselves once they were left without him. But their sorrow was not to last, for now, at a time when, he, when the world seemed to have rejected him, the hour had struck when Baha'u'llah came could lift the veil of mystery which surrounded his station and appear in his full glory. He was, he announced, that great teacher promised in all the holy scriptures of the world, for whose advent the Bab had prepared the way and for whose sake he had laid down his life. The declaration of Baha'u'llah made under such unusual circumstances were was a turning point in the history of the new cause. Now at last, the promise of the Bab had been fulfilled, the day of the unity of mankind had been ushered in, and no power on earth could stop its progress. Baha'u'llah's exile in Constantinople lasted no longer than four months, during which time a number of the notables of the city came under the influence of his teachings. Then he was sent still farther away to Adrianople. Here he stayed for almost five years, and from here he proclaimed his mission to the kings and rulers of the earth, as well as to the as celestial leaders of all religions. He called upon them to listen to the message of God, to come together, to resolve the differences, and to work for the promotion of world peace. When they failed to respond to his summons, he warned them of the consequences of their acts. He foretold the downfall of their institutions and lamented the terrible sufferings which humanity, forgetful of its God and oppressed by leaders, drunk with pride, would inflict upon itself. Through this suffering, however, he could see mankind emerging humbled and spiritually awakened, ready to turn to the masses of God. The revelation of Baha'u'llah, which had been born in the dungeon of Tehran and declared on the eve of his departure from Baghdad, reached its night in Adrianople. The force of this revelation could no longer be ignored by either the statesmen of the land or the clergy who were its ruthless enemies. In a desperate attempt to cross the infant fate whose followers were being drawn, from every religion and all strain of society, Baha'u'llah was banished once again, this time to the remote panel colony of the Turkish Empire, the prison city of Acre in the Holy Land. He was sent there to die, for it was known that few could survive the rigors of imprisonment in that foul and hostile place. 
in a letter to the despotic ruler who was pro- persecuting him bahaula wrote O king i have seen in the way of god what no eye had seen and no ear had heard how many calamities have descended and how many will descend my eyes rain down tears until my bed is drenched but my sorrow is not for myself yeah because i see mankind going astray in the intoxication and they know it not they have exalted their lust and put aside their god as though they took the command of god for a mockery a sport and a plaything and they think they do well and that they are hard bound in the citadel of security the matter is not as they suppose tomorrow they shall see what they now deny we are about to shift from this most remote place of banishment at Trinople unto the prison of Akka and according to what they say it is assuredly the most desolate of the cities of the world the most unsightly of them in appearance the most detestable in climate and the foulest in water it is and though it is as though it were the metropolis of the owl there is no heard from its region or good save the sound of its hooting and in it they intend to imprison the servant and to shut in our faces the doors of leniency and take away from us the good things of life of the world during what remained of our days by god though where very weariness so we can me and hunger so destroy me so my couch so should be made of the hard rock and my associates associates of the beast of the desert i will not blench but will be patient as the resolute and determined are patient in the strength of god through affliction had his light shone and his praise been bright and sizzlingly this had been his method through past ages and bygone times bahaulas followers were once more filled with sorrow at at this fresh calamities and cruel sufferings which was inflicted on their beloved master but bahaula assured them that the prison gates would be thrown open and the message of god would be taken from the holy land to all the parts of the earth as foretold in the holy books and so it was to be bahaula his family and many of his followers who had refused to be separated from him were made to bear terrible hardship in the prison of akka but in time the unfriendly population of the pa- panel colony the uncouth prison guards and even the officers in charge were slowly affected by the spirit of the teachings of the noble prisoner who had made his home among them the orders were the orders which were repeatedly received in akka concerning the severe measures that were to be enforced against bahaula were gradually disregarded by those in charge of the prison and the travelers who arrived from far distances often on foot to visit bahaula were no more turned away from the city gate the time came when after 9 years of confin- confinement the highest religious official in akka begged bahaula to terminate his imprisonment without the city walls within the city walls and to uh, and to go live in the country where a beautiful mansion had been rented for him despite the fact that the government never withdrew the prison sentence bahaula lived the last years of his life under conditions very different from what his enemies had hoped 
was again a stream of visitors people of every class and description came from the surrounding countries to hear his teachings and his ever increasing followers now known as bahais took the life giving message from the holy land to the world outside among those who came to visit bahaula at this time was the famous orientalist professor edward g brown of the university of cambridge who has recorded his impressions of the meeting he writes the face of him on whom i gazed i can never forget though i cannot describe it those piercing eyes seem to read one's very soul power and authority set on that ample brow no need to ask in whose presence i stood as i bowed myself before one who is the object of a devotion and love which kings might envy and emperors sigh for a, for in vain a mild dignified dignified voice bade me be seated and then continued praise be to god that thou has attained thou has come to see a prisoner and an exile we desire but the good of the world and happiness of the nations yet this deem us to deem us a stirrer up of strife and sedition would worthy of bondage and banishment that all nations should become one in faith and all men in main as brothers that the bonds of affection and unity between the sons of man should be strengthened that diversity of religion should co- cease and differences of race be annulled what harm is there in this yet so it shall be these fruitless strife these ruins ruins wars shall pass away and the most great peace shall come let not a man glory in this that he loves his country let him rather glory in this that he loves his kind such so far as i can recall them were the words which beside many others i heard from baha let those who read them consider well with themselves whether such doctrines merit death and bonds and whether the world is more likely to gain or lose by their diffu- diffusion throughout his tr- turbulent life bahaula found time to write works which would fill over a hundred volumes among them are his famous letters to the kings and rulers of the world his beautiful prayers and meditations and spiritual and social laws before he passed away in 1892 bahaullah safeguarded his fate from splitting into sects by appointing his son abdul baha at the as the one to whom all bahais should turn for guidance he was to be the sole interpreter of bahaullah's writings and exemplar of his cause